Thank you, Celia. Um, so I'll just get right into it. I'm happy to be here today um, to talk with you all about um, our use of group model building to develop a qualitative system dynamics model of overdose bystander behavior in the context of Connecticut's Good Samaritan laws. Yeah, I think I'm like, thank you. Yeah. All good, or do I need to? You are all good, don't you okay. worry. Okay, great. So uh, I'd just like to acknowledge all of the co-authors on this work, um, particularly want to shout out to Dr. Nassim Sabunchi, who is my system dynamics mentor, and uh, Dr. Rebecca Heckman, who is the PI on this project from Yale University um, Department of Emergency Medicine. And these are our declarations about study funding, um, and we have no conflicts of interest to declare. So opioid overdose um, and opioid use disorder have, has been a uh, complex and persistent public health problem in the United States. Um, this is a, kind of a famous graph from the Centers for Disease Control, um, and it shows the different uh, waves of the opioid epidemic over time uh, across the whole US. So it started back in the early 2000s with this rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths, followed by a rise in heroin overdose deaths around 2010. And then moving into our current um, era of the problem, which is this really dramatic um, exponential increase in deaths associated with uh, synthetic opioids, which includes fentanyl. Uh, the state of Connecticut has been particularly um, impacted by the epidemic in 2020 the uh, rate of drug-induced mortality in Connecticut was 38% higher than the national average, and 93% of those overdoses, uh, those fatal overdose deaths, had involved opioids. So this is just showing uh, kind of a similar uh, plot over time uh, for one specific uh, hard-hit area in Connecticut, the New Haven region. But you can see by the green line, uh, fentanyl deaths have really, you know, skyrocketed in the past few years, starting in around two. 2019, um, specifically deaths uh, associated with fentanyl. And this problem is not, it, it's, it's, it's really cost our society a lot. Um, in the US, uh, estimated uh, opioid use disorder and fatal overdose um, costs an estimated $1 trillion a year. And in Connecticut, the costs are around $17.2 billion a year which uh, is, is made up of healthcare and criminal justice costs, loss of productivity, reduced quality of life and value of those lives lost from overdose. So the, this persistent and complex challenge of, of opioid overdose has, has uh, led us to consider more innovative public policy approaches to deal with the epidemic. Uh, one such approach is Good Samaritan laws. Um, so they're really, the name comes from the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which basically a Jewish man is robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. And a Samaritan who is supposed to be his enemy ends up stopping and helps him and ultimately saves him his life. So Good Samaritan laws are very much in the spirit of this uh, parable, where um, basically the intent is to protect bystanders who assist people who have experienced an overdose without fear of facing civil or criminal consequences themselves. Uh, in Connecticut, these uh, the protections of the Good Samaritan law extend to a wide variety of people who are assisting people who have experienced an overdose, including the bystanders themselves, what we call the Good Samaritans, uh, first responders, healthcare providers, people who are um, supplying or purchasing naloxone. So for those of you don't, who don't know naloxone, it's a life-saving, sort of antidote to an opioid overdose. And then uh, there are also some protections to the individuals who have experienced the overdose themselves. So the, the evidence for Good Samaritan laws has been pretty mixed so far. Um, some studies have shown no significant reductions in opioid overdose deaths. Um, and, and some other studies have shown up to 15% reduction in the one to two years following their enactment. And these, these laws apply all over the US in different states, so I should add that. But um, uh, the literature kind of highlights a few potential reasons for why Good Samaritan laws have not been particularly impactful. Um, this includes a lack of knowledge of the protections among potential bystanders, uh, first responders, and people who use drugs, as well as distrust of law enforcement and fear of legal conse consequences, even when the knowledge about uh, protections is correct. 
And so since this is a complex policy resistant problem, it naturally lends itself to a system dynamic study. So these were our modeling objectives going into this. Um, one is to develop a system's understanding of the forces and feedback processes and in influencing bystander behavior. Two is to identify potential high leverage policies for improving Good Samaritan law impact. And three is in increase community stakeholder capacity to apply systems thinking to address the opioid epidemic. So uh, we held some group model building sessions, uh, six in total. Uh, the first three of these sessions were kind of preliminary modeling sessions where the goal was to identify the key facilitators and barriers influencing effectiveness of uh, the Good Samaritan laws, obtain reference modes, and then create some initial causal loop diagrams. Uh, we engaged a variety of different stakeholders in these sessions, including healthcare providers, public health professionals, uh, first responders, police officers, and even some individuals who had lived experience of overdose or being a bystander. Then we had uh, two additional uh, GMB session follow-up sessions where we solicited feedback on the initial causal loop diagrams and uh, identified policy scenarios and discussed how they interfaced with the feedback loops in these CLDs. Again, uh, a mix of different people um, attended these sessions. And then finally, we had a, a plenary uh, GMB session where we presented a synthesis of our key findings and narratives uh, from the CLDs and then identified uh, and set a, sort of a policy agenda based on the priorities of the stakeholders that were present. So this next slide is gonna walk through uh, the development of our model. So first we started with a, a seed causal loop diagram, which was just a couple of simple loops around you know, what happens um, during an overdose. Uh, from these initial seed models, we developed three initial uh, causal loop diagrams uh, alongside the participants who were attending those first three GMB sessions. We used a variety of different uh, group model building scripts, including variable elicitation and behavior over time graphs. Then we refined these three uh, CLDs in the follow-up sessions um, with the help of and feedback from the, the participants. Then we took those three separate causal loop diagrams and we merged them into one causal loop diagram by uh, systematically consolidating similar concepts across the three maps. And then we finally presented that, that final merged causal loop diagram in the last uh, plenary group model building session where we got some more feedback on the model as well as uh, discussed the policy scenarios and how they interfaced with the CLB. So this is a kind of, this is our final product, our simplified uh, causal loop diagram that we presented to the participants at the plenary GMB session. And the colors here correspond to loops that were identified um, by uh, different sets of participants in different GMB sessions. So the red loops correspond to those identified during the first GMB session, which was mainly healthcare providers. The green loops correspond to um, those identified during the second session, which was mostly uh, first responders. Blue corresponds to the third session, which was um, individuals with lived experience and harm reduction um, folks. And then uh, the pink is um, loops that were identified in kind of those combined follow-up sessions. So in total, uh, what we presented back to the participants in that final session was three reinforcing feedback loops and seven balancing feedback loops. And the way that we kind of organized these is into model narratives, which told some sort of story um, relating to Good Samaritan law implementation or um, use of naloxone. So those four narratives are um, overdose, um, experiences of people calling 911, and then uh, that leading to first responder burnout. The second narrative is related to naloxone use, acceptability of naloxone and linking patients to services. The third is related to drug arrests, uh, community belief in the Good Samaritan laws and trust in police. And then the fourth is related to bystander naloxone use, community participation in harm reduction and cultural change towards carrying naloxone. So I'm just gonna walk through a few example loops uh, from each of these model narratives. So this, this first is a balancing loop. And so you start here um, as, as more overdoses are being experienced in the community, this can lead to burnout of first responders dealing with those overdoses. 
which can ultimately lead to potential mistreatment um, of patients by first responders, leading to less likelihood of patients to call 911. And unfortunately, that contributes to more overdose deaths and the balancing effect, which is uh, decreasing the population with opioid use disorder. This next loop is from the second model narrative. So uh, this kind of illustrates one of the potential unintended consequences of policies which fo focus only on naloxone use. So as more um, bystanders are using naloxone, uh, and they're they're really saving lives by that use of the naloxone, but they're they're that leads to less um, patients who've experienced an overdose going to the hospital and less linkage to services, which ultimately leads to could lead to more them experiencing more overdoses in the long run and increasing the demand for naloxone. So that's a reinforcing process. But again, it shows that um, you know naloxone use alone can lead to more demand for and use of naloxone which is great, but we also need to make sure that we're pairing that sort of strategy with a, a strategy to linkage to treatment so people can uh, treat the, the underlying sort of morbid, morbidity of the opioid use disorder problem. Uh, the next loop is uh, related to uh, the role of police and the Good Samaritan laws. So as, as police are conducting more arrests for people who are, um, you know, how, uh, possessing drugs, then this this leads to a decreased belief um, of harm reduction agencies and the actual impact of the Good Samaritan laws, which can decrease their the uh, relationships with law enforcement and the culture of harm reduction in the community, which can ultimately lead to increase an increase of police's uh, sorry a decrease in police's willingness to abide by the Good Samaritan laws, and further increases the number of arrests that are happening. So really a vicious cycle. And then finally, this is a bit more positive reinforcing loop, but uh, as, as more bystanders are using naloxone, this uh, increases participation in harm reduction by people in the community, um, friends, friends of the people who are being bystanders. And this could contribute to cultural change towards carrying naloxone, ultimately increasing the acceptability of naloxone and furthering the, the use of naloxone. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is the uh, policy uh, in, in the final GMD plenary session, we conducted a policy ranking exercise with the participants. So across the, the GMB sessions, we identified 64 different policies and interventions. And what we wanted to do is distill this list of policies into potential high impact and high priority um, policies and also have a discussion with participants about potential unintended and intended consequences of the various policies that they were selecting. So we prompted them uh, to think about if there was no limit to funds and resources, what strategies did, do they think would have the most impact? And then we asked them to rank various uh, buckets of strategies in order from greatest potential impact to least. And we conducted this in poll EV. It, this is fonts kind of small, but you can see here in this particular uh, ranking activity, they rated leave behind uh, programs, basically leaving naloxone at the scene of an overdose rather highly. Then we showed, um, given the, the feedback loops in our, our model, um, how various policies uh, interface with those feedback loops. For example, here uh, you can see a community-based peer education program impacting cultural change towards carrying naloxone as well as acceptability of naloxone. And then we, we discussed if they agreed with where the points of system impact were drawn and if there were any other intended or unintended consequences of the policies. So out of that activity, these were the four sort of um, policy theme areas that, that the participants rated as high priority and potentially high impact. So one is increasing naloxone access and use, for example, that lead behind program. Uh, another is uh, ramping up community-based harm reduction services and teams. So for example, connecting patients with treatment for opioid use disorder as soon as possible after an overdose. Um, safe, uh, safer drug use. So for example, um, you know, establishing safe places to use drugs as well as smartphone application that alerts others when uh, the person overdoses. And then education to reduce stigma. So this is specifically among new law, law enforcement emergency department staff, as well as medical trainees. 
So just some key takeaways from our modeling efforts. Good Samaritan laws alone are not effective to reduce opioid related deaths. Um, and tackling the opioid crisis in Connecticut and beyond is going to require innovative solutions, which enhance the effectiveness of multiple harm reduction policies, which target novel intervention points within the system, which we identified and talked about, such as improving trust between law enforcement and the community, reducing stigma among first responders and healthcare providers, and leveraging community-based harm reduction teams to link patients to care. So next steps for this, uh, this work um, are to use the insights from our model to update and operationalize a quantitative system dynamics model we've been working on to evaluate Connecticut's Good Samaritan laws, and then to um, use to conduct a formal policy analysis using these policy priorities that were identified by stakeholders. Since at this point we we don't really know, you know, if if these these priorities that were identified as high impact will be the highest impact, we have to do a more formal quantitative analysis to establish that. So here are my references and the last blog I want to give is that if you're interested in learning more about becoming a bystander and carrying the lock zone, uh, you can scan this QR code or go to this website, naloxoneforall.org, and there is information if you, you if you live in the United States about uh, where you can get naloxone in your state. Um, so thank you for listening to my presentation, and I think I do have some time for questions before I run to the airport. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, if you are in the room and have questions, feel free to raise your hand. I am going to repeat the questions because I had to pull that mic away because it was making terrible noises. So if you have questions in the room, let me know. If you're online, feel free to raise your hand uh, or drop in the chat. Okay. Yes, we have one from Tim. Uh, great presentation, Rachel. Really appreciate it. If I'm understanding correctly, the causal loop diagram is a sort of shifting the burden where the increase of naloxone causes a decrease in reaching out for services. Given the nature of the naloxone that it's an item, is there any idea to tie that to that the item itself has the information you need, like a message or something like that that says, if you bought this or if you use this, we strongly suggest you know these services or things like that. So as the use of this item increases, the knowledge of the services also increases. That is a fantastic question. And that that would be great if actually I think um I so I got naloxone from the New York City Health Department and there there is like an information card in the naloxone kit about some of these things like getting connected to harm reduction services etc but it's a great it's great that you um, pointed this out because our research team is actually uh recently was awarded another grant to study and implement um a smartphone application and really, the goal is to do just that, to link patients to services in, in ways that they that wouldn't necessarily be linked before and not necessarily through those traditional channels of like interacting with the EMS or getting to the hospital, et cetera. So uh, basically, I think we are thinking of implementing this in different ways, but like, um, you know, having community based harm reduction teams go out and, and advertise this sort of QR code and link that will have um, an opportunity for patients to first talk with a chat bot and then kind of get connected to, to uh, treatment services over time. Anybody else? Okay, we got one more. Yes, Jason. Thank you, Rachel. Um, question if you have data, I'm not too familiar with overdoses or, or how the dynamics work, but I'm interested What's the frequency or, or how, how common are repeat um, overdoses uh, as that happening? It's, it's yeah. very common, unfortunately. So um, if, if a person has naloxone, you know, they're probably not going to die from the overdose. And so, um, again, this goes back to this, this sort of the key the key thing here is like you have to link patients to treatment. Naloxone is fantastic and it's saving lives, but you also have to make sure these people have like have access to treatment and they have like the social supports to continue in treatment uh, and toward, work towards recovery. So uh, yeah, the, the answer to your question is that unfortunately repeat repeat overdoses are very common. And I can't forget, I can't remember the exact sort of statistics on that, but depending on too, um, how 
uh, what your like frequency of use is, it, it increases uh, your risk of overdose greatly increases the more frequently you're using opioids. Yeah, I guess yeah. repeat overdoses, although not great, could be a better outcome than just one and done. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, if you're if there's only one overdose and you die from it, then that's much worse outcome. But right. but yeah, naloxone is definitely like a life saving and very important intervention. But again, it's like it just highlights the importance of looking at this from a systems perspective because you really have to tie in these other interventions as well, not just not just that. Okay, I think Tim had one more question, or we can be done. If there's anyone else. And it's you. Okay, um, I just wanted to clarify, you mentioned the erosion of trust between law enforcement and users. That makes sense. I wasn't sure though if there was, as the first responders get burnout, whether that is sensed by the users who then have an erosion of trust that like you didn't take me seriously, I'm just a burden on you. Are they sensing the burnout of the first responders and sort of eroding the trust and calling the first responders much like law enforcement? Did you, any word on that? That's a good question. So I think really what happens is that the first responders get burnt out and then they start to mistreat the patients or treat them in a really stigmatized way. And so, and, and, and you know, there's a lot of pressure and, and sort of like overwork on first responders as well, especially considering like the COVID pandemic and everything. So I think, I think a lot of these GMB sessions we conducted during the, the COVID pandemic, and that was that was one of the things that came up was that, you know, a lot of these EMS, um, you know, responders are, are uh, just extremely overworked. And if, and, and actually the, the circumstances is when you do have repeat overdoses and you're continuing to go back to that same address, that same person over and over and over again, it really wears on you. And I think that's, that really is, is how it's affecting patients is like through the treatment there, the, the treatment of these individuals who've had an overdose by the first responders once they start to feel burnt out and, and feel like there's not really any hope in the situation. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. This was wonderful. Um, go catch your flight. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> hope to, I will be there, hopefully, tonight. So I, I hope to see all of you at the conference over the course of the week. Thanks.